Today I'm going to be talking about food preservation. I'm from the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension. So we are a partner here with Green Our Planet and today I'm just going to present just some basics on food preservation. So food preservation has been going on since the dawn of time because we've needed food in months or seasons where that food is not available or where you cannot plant those foods to have that food. So food preservation is a science. And today I'm gonna to go ahead and tell you a little bit about this program, about what we do to preserve our foods. And it is a application of science-based knowledge through a variety of equipment and procedures to prevent the deterioration and spoilage of foods and products and to extend their shell life. So food preservation came about for the need of preserving those foods during the months where we don't have them. Usually this was during the winter seasons. And the most common ones were, or methods were, salting your foods, either um, doing a lot of fermentation, so you have a lot of pickling, and, and then of course you have dehydration. Those were the three most popular methods to preserve those foods. They weren't always the best methods, and it's evolved to kind of meet the needs of all the different types of food varieties that we have, including not just plants, but animals as well. Your poultry, your fish, uh, all types. So there are currently six methods that we currently use to preserve our foods, and they are all based on a pH level scale. Depending on the acidity of a product, we are going to choose one of the food preservation methods to preserve those foods. So we have a pH level that goes from 1.0 to 14.0. The higher the number, that is going to be a base or less or low acidity food, which is going to be preserved using a different method. So you have 1.0 to 4.6. That is going to be your category of high acid foods. These foods are going to be used a variety of methods. So you can go ahead and dehydrate them, you can freeze them, and you can use something called the water bath method. For the ones that are 4.7 and above, those are your low acid foods. So your combination foods, soups, sauces, any type of vegetable is actually going to be in this category. So you're going to use something called pressure canning. And maybe some of us have seen that with our family members. We have old recipes. Maybe you've seen that huge piece of equipment that kind of looks kind of intimidating. So depending on the food that you are interested in preserving, there is a completely different method. Not all foods can be preserved using one or the other method. There is a science behind it. So if you have a low acid food, you have to go through a certain process high acid foods, it has to go through the required process in order to safely uh, preserve those foods. One of the biggest concerns we have with home canned goods is botulism. Botulism affects your nervous system, so it affects your muscles, of respiratory, your heart, all that stuff. So when we talk about preserving foods, we think about science-based knowledge because we don't want to end up with any botulism spores in our foods. So what is a water bath canner? So essentially it's just a big pot that you can fill up with water and at the bottom you have this rack where your jars are going to be you know, sustained so it doesn't touch the very bottom of your pot. If they do touch, they tend to crack or fracture and that's something that we don't want. So basically we have the space for at least six quart jars but when we go ahead and think about our equipment, we also have to think about the equipment that we have at home. So think about your range. If the circumference and the bottom of the canner or your pot uh, extends or is too big for your range or your stove, then you're using the wrong type of pot. It cannot 
be more than the circumference of what you have at home. And that is because heat needs to be distributed evenly so everything is processed according to regulations and safety. So with this type of canner, most, if not all, our high acid foods are going to be processed here. So that's all your fruits, sauces, jams, jellies, marmalades, conserves, and other preserves, tomato mixtures that do not include meats, and of course, pie mixtures. So you can go ahead and make a apple pie or strawberry pie, can it, and then use it later on. And this is the one that a lot of people are kind of afraid of using just because we've heard the horror stories, you know, they kind of explode, <laughs> they, they end up on the roof, it goes everywhere. It's a myth. So depending on the range that you're using, this one is going to be a little special. So if you have a glass top surface, not all gas, uh, glass top ranges are going to be adequate for the different types of canners, pressure canners that we have available. So you actually have to check with your manufacturer if you want to can something using a pressure canner if you have a glass top. Some glass tops will crack and you're going to you know, kind of destroy your, your cooking surface there. And some are able to withstand the heat and the weight of these particular types of equipment. So if you do have a glass stove, that's something that we have to keep in mind just because you know, we don't want to ruin what we cook with. And then, of course, we have to go ahead and look at the different varieties that we have out there. So we have the ones that do not have the dial gauge. And these guys are kind of scary because we don't know where the pressure level is, but they're quickly, um, they're easy to use. You, you quickly learn how to use them, and there are tells to know when the pressure is right. So these guys are used to do all of your low acid foods, your combination foods, so your soups, your sauces, your meats, your poultry, your seafood, your vegetables, some fruits that need to be acidified go through this process. Now the difference between a water bath canner and a pressure canner is that the water bath canner only reaches a certain level of heat and doesn't have a lot of pressure added to those foods. So when you have microorganisms that will be killed after 240 degrees and they are high acid foods, you can put them in the water bath canner. That means that after they've been processed, all of those guys are gone. But then there are microorganisms that survive 240 degrees and need the pressure and the added heat to kill them off. And typically they're found in your low acid foods or your combination foods. So you need a completely different piece of equipment in order to safely process those foods. Again, here we have our index. And when we look at our different varieties of product or recipes, our recipe books need to come from ver certified sources. And certified sources are going to be the Department of Agriculture. The USDA um, has a lot of handy material on their website. The University of Georgia's Cooperative Extension are the leaders in food preservation. So they've teamed up with our governmental agencies and they've created all the different handbooks and all the different information that is out there for the public to use when preserving foods. Now, when we look at your foods, not all tomatoes are created equally, not all apples are created equally, and so there are some that can be water, um, water bath canned processed and there's some that need to be pressure canned. So your guides are actually going to tell you what <coughs> acidification process they need to go under and what equipment you're going to need. So the food preservation program basically is informing a new generation of people that are interested in this craft. Now it's something that a lot of people have heard of. Maybe we've heard from our, you know, family members, they've done this a long time ago, but it's a science that's kind of gone out of style and it's coming back, you know, with a lot of interest in the youth. You know, a lot of people are very interested in how to preserve these foods, how to go about and take what you preserve and actually sell them in a farmer's market. What I do is teach you all the different 
techniques and methods and information that you will need to know to actually do these processes. So here is just a clarification of the danger zone and when we look at the danger zone, that is going to be the temperatures between the ranges of 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees. So your temperature of which foods need to be refrigerated at is usually 40 degrees. So when you look at those foods, if they're kept in refrigeration, they're going to be okay. But if they are between those levels, between the lowest part of our thermometer and 140 degrees, you have a perfect climate for those microorganisms to thrive and multiply. So this is what we call the danger zone. And this is something that has been scientifically researched that this is the best atmosphere, environment for these little guys. So we don't want to give them that environment and we want to go ahead and just kind of do things safely. So altitude and elevation. So when we are processing our foods, our foods are going to need a kind of, I guess, gauge of how much time frame they need to be proce processed for or how much pressure you're going to add. Water is going to boil at different elevations. So depending on your altitude and elevation, you're going to adjust the time frame if you're using a water bath processing method you're either going to use the one that is in your guide or you're going to extend it depending on your elevation, usually five to 10 minutes if you are at higher elevations. So for example, here, if I were to look at a guidebook, I would see 15 minutes for that recipe, but I would adjust it to my elevation here. So I would be adding five to 10 more minutes to that processing time of those foods. For pressure canning, it's completely different. You add pressure, you do not uh, modify the time frame for processing those foods. What you do is just add more pressure to the canner and you keep the same processing time. So depending on what you're using, you're either going to look at increasing that time frame or increasing the pressure. So this is an example of a recipe and I'm looking at two different packing styles and these are just different methods of preserving foods. And if I have something that is in a pint jar, it's going to process for a short amount of time. And if it's something in a larger jar, in a quart jar, it's going to process five to 10 minutes more just because there is more product in that jar. So it needs more time in order to be processed safely. And depending on your altitude, you're also going to be adjusting that time frame or pressure. So when we talk about school gardens and then you talk about fruit preservation, they go hand in hand because after you have your bountiful harvest, what do you do? If you can't sell it at a farmer's market and you kind of want to keep it, so food uh, preservation is the next step. So for most of our foods, you know what has been done to that food. You know that there are no pesticides. You know how long they've been out of the ground once you've harvested them. Um, and you know the quantities that you have. So you're able to do a lot with those foods because you know how much you have. And of course, if you were to take that product and you were to preserve it somehow and you sell it at a farmer's market, now you have something that is valuable financially. It's something that can come back to your garden. It's something that is a life skill. You're learning to both manage your garden and you're gonna manage a uh, checkbook because thinking about preserving uh, these foods involves thinking about the quantities that you have and the amount of materials that you're going to have to buy before you're able to sell that product. So another kind of mentality goes into this kind of thing. And of course, you know what you're eating and what your foods have been or what they've been through. A lot of foods, we, we kind of don't know where they're coming from. A lot of kids, before they had the gardens, they were like, where did your food come from? They'd say the grocery store or the pantry. And with this, you, you know, you get to see it at your school garden and it's basically farm to table. You prepare those foods and you keep them and then you eat them. Alrighty, it is a useful skill. So learning how to cook, preserve, 
do the budgeting, depending on how much you have, the materials that you need. Those are life skills that you're going to need later on in life. So when you start young and you learn that food is valuable, it has value because if you can't preserve it, it goes bad. You've lost that produce. Um, if you're able to do something with that produce, you make it into a jam or a jelly or whatnot, and you're able to sell it, you know that there is value in that food. And a lot of students don't learn the value of food until they have to throw something away. So this is just a method or a way of teaching just that food has value and that you can do things with it. Let's see. And of course, cottage foods and craft foods are two different things and they are managed by the Southern Health District here. And I work with them, I partnered with them to meet the needs of the community. So basically what I do is if they have a question regarding a certain method of preservation and um, if I get a question about how to do a certain application, we work hand in hand. So if there is a school or if there's someone interested in doing any of these methods, I go out and teach. And if there is an application or a certain process they want to go through, I partner with them and help them go through that process. So food preservation isn't just something that you can do at home, you can bring it into your schools. It's a very valuable skill to have. So there are some disadvantages to preserving our foods. One of those disadvantages is that if you don't grow enough product, you may not have enough uh, to make a certain item. For example, for a strawberry jam, you're going to need about two pints or two little cases of strawberries, which is a lot of strawberries if they're coming from your school garden, in order to make about half a pint of jam. And that's a lot of strawberries for that little bit of jam. So when you look at it that way, you kind of have to grow a lot of that produce. Then you have the equipment and materials. So if you are planning on doing this on your school, there are certain ways to kind of curb the costs of certain items. For example, the water bath canner, you can use any large pot buy a rack and that is your water bath canner. For pressure canners, you can't really do that. You kind of have to, you know, dig into your pocketbook and you have to use um, that equipment for that particular method. But for most recipes that are great for children, a lot of water bath canning. You can do a lot of that. You can go ahead and can all sorts of fruits, um, all sorts of jams and jellies. They are very popular with the kids. Uh, Pre-K children can do jams and jellies. There are certain recipes where you don't even have to cook those berries. They are called uh, freezer jams or refrigerator jams. And all you do is get your berries or your fruit, you crush it, you put the pectin, you go ahead and mix them up really nice, and then you put them in jars and you freeze them or you put them in the refrigerator. But with that method, it does take a little bit for that mixture to gel and become jam-like. Jam but if you have students that you're not quite ready for them to use a stove or a range, that's a great kind of like bridge to have, you know, between actually doing the entire process and just starting off as a true beginner. And storage, we go over everything, how to store these things, or when we have to throw them away, um, how to go ahead and do the decontamination phase if there is something growing inside those jars. We don't just want to throw them away because botulism is an airborne spore. So it's something that you can breathe in and it can cross-contaminate different things. So we go through all of that. And for us in Las Vegas, we live in a place where there's a lot of heat waves. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's coming. Mm -hmm. So the adequate temperatures to store our foods are usually between 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And a lot of people kind of struggle to think about a place where that temperature is never going to fluctuate. Well, think about your closets. You always have a co like coat closet or something that you have just random things stored in. There is no sunlight, there's no fluctuations of temperature, um, 
people don't usually go in there and kind of, you know, rummage through things. So when you think about locations, we actually help people kind of think about where they can stro store their, their products. Or if freezing is something that you like to do, we do a lot of freezing, a lot of dehydration, because with freezing, it doesn't matter if there's a heat wave outside, it's frozen. With dehydration, it doesn't matter if it's hot outside, it's dehydrated. It's not going to spoil. Um, and it's going to last a very long time. With your canned goods, you're going to see a 12 to 18 month period of preservation. And we don't exceed that because the seals of our jars are only guaranteed up to 18 months. But nutritionally speaking, 12 months is the period where your foods will have no nutrition. So by the time you hit a year, you either eat it or you want to dispose of it properly. One of the methods I did not put up here is, uh, what is it? Freeze drying. Freeze drying is what you do to food where you put them in a vacuum seal, you take out all the moisture, but it keeps its shape, its integrity, and its texture and flavor. It's what we call space food. So if you have any uh, ice cream that is, uh, what is it, frozen and it's kind of, you know, air-like, that's one of the other methods that is becoming very popular, so that's something that we also do. Um, and that type of food preservation will last you 25 years. And all the equipment I use is industrial equipment. Um, the Mylar packaging for that type of food processing is going to be military grade. Um, so when we go ahead and learn about food preservation, it's a resource that you can use at home, you can use at your school gardens, you learn how to preserve foods, you learn a host of things that you can do. So if there is any school or teacher that is interested in having a workshop, I can go ahead and schedule those off-site. That means I go to your location and we teach you how to do this kind of stuff with the students. And there is a curriculum for students so they can go ahead and learn these different processes. And they're typically geared towards third, fourth, and fifth graders. But if you have younger students, we can find recipes that don't involve any hot plates or boiling water or anything like that. So if there is anyone interested in having a session at their school or learning anything about this, even pickling is something that's very easy to do. Three ingredients, you're done. Put it in the refrigerator. A week later, you have pickles. Um, go ahead and contact me.